Welcome to the Insurance Brokers Podcast with your host, Sarah Myerskoff. This business podcast is for ambitious brokers determined to grow their business. Our guests are highly experienced industry experts and innovators. This is the place to leverage their success, learn how to break through barriers to growth, and discover a community of support and ideas whilst growing your business. Good morning, Jason. Good morning, Steve. I'm really delighted to have you here on the Insurance Brokers Podcast, take two, with no internet issues this time. Uh, I think it's a really interesting topic, one that's quite personal to me at the moment, uh, as you well know, and we're talking about water damage. So I wonder if um, perhaps, Steve and Jason, you could give a little intro to yourself, your role at Miller Insurance, and then we can crack on with learning about water damage and why it is so important. Steve. Thanks, Sarah. I'm Steve Cox. I've uh, been in the insurance market for 41 years now, uh, always handling construction insurance. And I'm the head of Miller's UK and international construction team. And my colleague, Jason, is going to introduce himself. Yeah, good morning. Thanks as well, Sarah. Uh, so uh, I'm Jason Baston. I've been in the property and casualty sector really now for 20 years or so uh, and focused very much on construction for uh, over the last decade. Fabulous. Um, so absolutely the right people to be speaking to about this particular topic. Let's start very broad. Tell me, what is water damage and why should it bother me? Well, I mean, water damage um, through a number of things, whether that be uh, ingress of water onto a site or into a building or escape of water within a building has actually become one of the leading causes for insurance claims in the UK and certainly for insurance claims in buildings undergoing construction or renovation. Um, so it's certainly caught insurers' um, eyes and they're doing lots of things in their own mind to uh, to try and make sure that everyone sees it as clearly as they do so they're uh, they're making some changes to policies uh, not necessarily excluding it but making it more expensive to buy uh, more expensive to have a claim by use of higher deductibles and uh, well basically it's it's making making sure that everyone's mind is focused on the problem and presumably the ways to mitigate the problem uh, and to bring down things like premiums um uh, across the board. Jason, do you want to add anything else to that? What, what kind of things do you see are causing water damage? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a real problem. It's, a, it's become a big headache, if you like, in the industry itself. Um, I suppose sort of stepping back uh, and, and thinking about, you know, water damage initially, one of the biggest issues is it doesn't get the same profile. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't raise uh, a, a major kind of public sort of incident when these things happen. If we think and contrast it to fire, for example, what you tend to see with a fire is, of course, you know, immediately you're going to get smoke that's going to be visible for miles around. Everybody's heads are turned. Uh, the press attention is gained. Uh, there's panic. Uh, and of course, everybody wants to, to know what's happening and it gets heavily reported on. And so fire has this uh, sort of extra level of uh, awareness in society. And of course it has a huge threat to loss of life as well as property damage. And then I guess we contrast that to, to what happens with escape of water and water damage. It's a, it's a silent uh, sort of uh, damage event, if you like. It doesn't get loads of uh, press attention. It's happening behind the scenes. It's, you know, it's, it's a silent partner, if you like, in the in the causes of major, major losses uh, in the construction world. And that's simply because it's happening behind closed doors. Nobody knows uh, or sees it happening until it's too late. Usually, if you have, you know, two buildings opposite each other and one's got a fire and one's got this huge sort of water escape event going on, you know, we can all guess which one is going to, uh, to, to, to get everybody's attention. But actually, they both can cause uh, just as much uh, damage. And what's, what's, what's needed now really is, is much more awareness and attention on that silent partner and, and the, the issues that water damage uh, is causing in the sector because it's causing enormous losses. I, I, just talking about fire and water, presumably a big fire also incurs water damage from firefighters. So yeah. there's there's all sorts of silent partners. You've got the, the, the firefighter water damage 
condensation, I suppose, yeah. um, c can cause a lot of problems, particularly, I suppose, in a high rise building, multi tenanted, tenanted um, the damage right. could be quite extensive. Right. Uh, interestingly, yeah, actually, it doesn't have to be a large fire, uh, a relatively small fire, which is uh, that happens high up in a building. Uh, has that effect where they come in with their hoses and put it out, the water goes somewhere and generally it's going to go downwards and impact uh, floors in the building below where the fire happened. So yeah. it doesn't actually have to be even that big a fire. Um, to, to and interestingly, really there was one, I suppose, just uh, three weeks or so ago uh, up in Leeds, there was the Leonardo buildings. Um, just, uh, I think that it was a project around about 60 million in value just to fit out as well. Uh, and that caught fire up near the top floors of the building. Um, and I think from memory, there was somewhere around sort of uh, a dozen, 10 dozen fire, fire engines sent. Of course, you know, they would have all been drenching uh, to put that fire out as quickly as possible. So you've got this situation where uh, near the top of the building, you've got, you know, the fire and fire, of course, going up and burning upwards, uh, typically. Uh, and then, of course, as soon as that water comes in and drenches the fire, you've got all of the floors below that are all going to suffer uh, water damage. So from an uh, uh, insurance industry perspective, you've mentioned that this is kind of the silent partner to fire, but that it's caught insurers' attention, presumably because of an increase in water damage claims and perhaps an increase in the um, cost of claims, given everything else that's going on in the market. Tell me yeah. a little bit about that. Why, why is that affecting the insurance industry so much and why do people need to know about it? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, I'll start by talking about what happened with fire. Um, it was probably in the late 80s and early 90s uh, that London witnessed itself a number of fire events with there being a fire up in Broadgate and probably the most famous one was the Minster Court development uh, between Mark Lane and Mincing Lane and I was involved in that when I worked for uh, Bowering and the ultimate cost of that one claim was about 150 million pounds uh, which exceeded the entire construction premium payable into the London market for UK construction projects for that year. So you had to literally have one claim cost all the premium that the market was having. Um, so once that happened, the insurance market said, well, we're fed up of seeing these big fires and they can wipe us out in no time if this continues. So they got together with a number of other parties and said, look, if for us to continue to be able to give this cover, we need to take action. And the Joint Code of Practice for the Prevention of Fire on Construction Sites, not the catchiest name, but we call it the JCOP, um, was born. And that came about and said, like, we're going to risk manage this, this approach through to, to improve the insurance of buildings against fire. And I have to say that, frankly, it seemed to work really well um, up until quite recently. I think 2018 had... Uh, some quite famous fires in the, in the market with uh, one in London, one in Glasgow that was actually a repeat of one that happened a few years ago and one over in uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and th those sort of came back and I think people wanted to refocus on them. But at the same time as those fires were happening, we were seeing uh, a, a huge increase in the number of water damage uh, incidents. And I think the, the largest one that I was told about by one particular uh, lead insurer was they paid a 30 million pound claim where a pipe burst on the upper floors of a of a building uh, which was undergoing a fitting out project uh, and that just basically happened on a on a friday uh, and it wasn't even discovered until a site security walk around sometime late on saturday and even when that was discovered the guy didn't know where to run to to, to go and switch off the water that was still cascading down. And it took another few hours to, to even turn off the water that was coming through at that time. So again, insurers have turned around and said, well, look, okay, it kind of worked quite well last time we did this um, by putting the joint JCOP in place. So let's attack this from a risk management perspective. And, and a group called CIREG uh, have come up with some guidance notes around uh, risk managing sort of water. Um, throughout the process of construction, particularly during, during construction. It will have a, an impact post-construction as well, but uh, 
the key thing for us and, and our, our insurers is how that's handled during construction. So they've developed the uh, this, this new code for sort of water management. Uh, and in it, it, uh, it, it asks people to prepare a water management plan uh, and to actually uh, give good thought to how they're going to manage risk. It gives obviously some very good hints as to how that should be done, but it, uh, it, it basically asks for that risk management to be contemplated at the earliest stage. So we're talking about mitigating any risk in relation to uh, water damage. And I think there's quite a lot, uh, I've got a lot of questions I want to ask you on that. But just before we go to that, I'm interested to really spell out not just the cost to insurance or insurers, but the cost to uh, claimants of a water damage claim. So I'm thinking reputational damage, I'm thinking legal disputes, I'm thinking disruption of projects. Talk to me about how that kind of um, wends its way wider than just the property damage. Yeah, absolutely. It, so people don't often realise until it happens uh, the extent of the disruption and the, the difficulties that water damage can lead to. Um, if we think about a project that is nearing completion, perhaps a few weeks away from that point of handover and, and, and practical completion of the works, we, you know, we've got a building uh, and a construction project that has amassed almost all of its build value by that point. And so when this damage event occurs, first of all, everybody is caught off guard. You know, they were expecting and planning just a few weeks time to open this sort of delightful new construction project uh, for whatever its intended purpose at the end. And now they've got this whole new set of challenges to deal with. First of all, they're going to just try and assess the situation, and understand what the, the problem is. Uh, but very quickly, the extent of the circumstances will start to, to play out uh, much greater. And if we think about what some of those things might be, the first one that's often ill considered is actually the loss of future income for a project. If we think about a hotel that might be constructed, some residential accommodations, student, student accommodations, very popular at the moment, for example. The project was built on the understanding that there would be this revenue stream uh, attaching to the project as soon as the building was complete and could be opened. And so now we've got this situation where that income is not going to be earned for quite some time, uh, potentially a number of years later. And so there are enormous losses uh, straight away from the revenue that was intended and, and part of that financing of, of the original construction project. I guess uh, as well, there's always a blame game after these incidents. So immediately somebody is going to look for the party that was at fault. What caused the loss in the first place? And there needs to be some very, very focused uh, and in-depth work to understand where that loss originated and then trying to ascertain who was to blame and of course we live in a world of legal challenge so who is liable to be uh, held accountable for the damages that were incurred those things take a lot of time and of course you know you mentioned about reputation or damage uh, relationships really matter in the construction industry and so what we tend to see unfortunately is this souring of relationships attracted legal disputes. And of course, everything comes at enormous costs. So at the same time as your revenue stream has dried up for a number of years, potentially, you've also now got substantial legal costs, substantial legal challenges and being undertaken. And you're trying to get a contractor to come back to site to rectify the damage, who at the same time is also subject to uh, a lot of mit litigation work uh, and, and particularly down the subcontract chain very often to the subcontractors. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a, um, in the construction industry, there is a um, a bit of a supply and demand issue with some, some uh, um, materials, but also there's a, a huge increase in cost of materials. So you're looking at, 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 you know, if you're redoing a piece of work, you're paying more than you did first time round. 
uh, because of the increased cost of materials. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Um, we've we've seen over the last two years um, that cost of construction materials has actually gone up by about 40% on certain pieces of kit. So yeah, you're, you're right. That's if you said that's even, but that's 20% per year. Uh, so that leads to massive claims cost inflation. Um, one of the good things about the way construction policies are written is it kind of allows for that within some of the terms of the policy. So it doesn't lead too much to an under insurance or too often to an under insurance, but it's not uh, beyond the realms of possibility that it could. Um, Going back to the answer Jason just gave as well, what I wanted to point out is that often if, if there's this escape of water gets into the electrics in any way, all of a sudden you lose the warranties on on electric, just electric cabling, let alone electric kit that's come in to power the building. And and once that warranty is gone, it basically has to be thrown away. And, and that's again, another massive delay and a massive cost associated with this creeping uh, water loss that, that does get created by just this escape of water throughout the building. I like the way you said that, the creeping water yes. loss, because that is exactly how I think of water loss. Um, tell me what uh, the transition towards MMC is. So we're seeing a, 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 a finally, at least in the sector, a, a kind of drive towards uh, greater use of technological advancement uh, and, and that's hard to integrate into an industry that's been used to bricks and mortar and traditional building methods. Of course, if we think about the whole sector, you know, all the way through from the design, the planning and the process through to the build, everybody's familiar with particular types of construction and with it being a very regulated approach uh, through planning and, and through all of, the, uh, all of the standards that have to be met. There is a difficulty in, in transitioning, but it's finally coming and we're seeing the greater use of uh, modular manufacturing, for example. If we think about a hotel, it might be that the bathroom component of every hotel room within that building has been built off site. It's been built as a whole single unit. It's then brought to site as a pod and it's then effectively installed in rather than being built in situ. And when we then think about how that plays out from a water perspective, you've got perhaps 50, 100 rooms, maybe more in a single building that have all been built off site and they're all replicated, they're all consistent. And that's great because what it does is it creates lower cost models, it creates consistency of, 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 of the product and hopefully a much greater level of quality of that component. On the flip side, of course, if there's a defect in that particular uh, module, in, the, in that pod, what you've suddenly got is the opposite. You've got a repeated scenario of, you know, scores of bathroom pods, for example, that are perhaps leaking and that's replicated throughout multiple rooms within the same construction building. And so on the one hand, the growth towards modular and modern methods uh, has created some fantastic opportunity and improvement in the sector. For water damage in particular, however, it creates this potential for series losses where you've got the same cause of loss happening multiple times in a single building, all derived from this module, for example. And that can create enormous losses because it's not just one single pod that's potentially led to a, a water damage event, but it's multi multiplied up. Presumably one of the issues is with uh, not just with modern methods of construction, but um, when you are building um, a, a large uh, uh, construction, say of a hotel with 200 rooms or whatever it might be, the turning on and connecting up of the water is one of the last things to happen, i.e. it's furnished, you've put the carpet down, you've, you've decorated, you've got the, the nice beds with the wonderful memory foam pillows in and all that kind of stuff. So presumably the reason one of the damage potential is now even greater is because, um, because things are costing more and, and, and you're already fully fitted out by the time that water <laughs> button is on. 
Yep, and as you say, all the soft furnishings are in there. Again, it'll be the sort of thing if they get any touch of water on them, they'll be they'll be for the tip rather than for for cleaning up uh, at that stage. Uh, but yes, you're right that there are many aspects like that. So, water damage, huge problem that creeps into many different areas of of a business uh, and, and personally and professionally it, it, it's huge what action and, and it's an increasing problem we've established this what actions are insurers taking now what what is it that those listening need to know and understand in terms of their own projects or advising clients etc i'll go the, the first thing they're doing there is as i may have mentioned earlier on I think it's affecting premiums. Uh, so if they're losing money, they want to uh, charge more into the future. So I think the first thing it's doing is it's affecting the premium rates. The second thing it's doing is it's affecting the deductible, the, the sort of the amount of self-insured retention that uh, a client must have. Uh, when I say it's affecting it, I mean, we've seen deductibles climb from maybe five to 10,000 uh, pounds up to 150,000 pounds. So a massive increase in the level of deductible. Now we might be able to negotiate that that sort of level from 150 back down a bit, maybe to 100 or 75 or even 50, with uh, the provision of an excellent water management plan. So a client that that's gone through the process with his contractors uh, and has developed with those contractors a water management plan that is handling all of the issues that some of which you described about the that phase of testing commissioning uh, where it is that first test of a wet system uh, and being able to say right we know that we've got people on various floors that are going to spot any minor leaks uh, they're going to stay there for an hour it's not just a turn it on turn it off um, there are stop valves put fitted on various uh, elements of the floor, maybe per floor or in in the example of a hotel suite it may be per hotel suite you can put a stop valve in on each each suite of a hotel uh, and that these sort of issues are contemplated and uh, the risk management process is designed and actioned throughout the period of the policy and most especially at those periods of high risk towards the end uh, of a construction period when you're finishing the the water system and indeed testing commissioning it so it's it, it's it is really crucial the amount of site visits that i've i've attended and you know one of the common questions uh, when you're at a site visit particularly if you have a, a surveyor in attendance uh who's attending on behalf of the insurers and, and just wanting to 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 ensure that that all of the risk management on site is appropriate other than fire, their next go-to will be about the water systems on that site. And what's always really interesting is the response that, that you witness when that question gets asked by the surveyor. I think as, as humans, naturally, our first thoughts around water damage immediately go to water ingress. I think, Steve, you mentioned, you know, how, how that has impacted the the industry and of course we all think of floods they they att attract a lot of news attention we've all perhaps witnessed you know a, a roof leak or some kind of water coming from outside of a building in and that's what ingress is all about but what is often forgotten and is not the immediate response of uh, of, of the the managers on a site typically is to think about the the risks of water within the building causing damage within the building so of course naturally then uh, and, and this is where it really does get interesting when you when you witness these conversations happening of course suddenly everybody's forced to to stop and and and, and about turn and start thinking about something which hadn't immediately sprung to mind the risks of water from within the building causing damage within and so these uh, these conversations that are happening now within the industry are really where the insurers are trying to to create that engagement and that action. First of all, raising the awareness and highlighting the fact that the water damage is not just coming from outside; it's actually coming from water systems within the building. And so, 
the the guidance that we're talking about here, the CIRED guidance, is very much focused on uh, that water system within the building, and it's very much focused on the, the larger commercial structures where we've got multiple floors, multiple tenants, perhaps, and of course, you know that that much greater risk. Presumably, there's kind of two levels to this 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 risk management when you're looking at any building, you know, my house through to the to the big uh, high rise constructions, and, and the two pronged approach has to be from day one where you're looking at awareness of uh, of potential risks, um, proper management of the workmanship that's happening. Uh, because I know uh, uh, dodgy workmanship is, is a big problem in these particular areas, right through to if there is an unforeseen problem that is not, you know, maybe it's a, a, a incorrectly um, insulated pipe that's frozen and burst um, or, or, you know, whatever it might be, right through to if there is an issue having all the stop valves and that kind of stuff. So there seems to be a very yeah. clear two pronged uh, approach. Can you talk to me about both in turn and what, what sort of things you're seeing and what, what the view insurers are taking on each of those areas. Yeah, I mean, the the things you describe, I mean, there are there are ways to stop the loss happening in the first place. I talked about managing the risk into, into a way that everything is done very well and very professionally. And risk surveys are often the, the way that, that that's happening. But then the, probably the key one in insurers' heads at the moment is is the reduction of a loss should an event happen i mean we're in insurance and we need there to be events i mean i say that very loosely um we live off the fact that people have accidents people have claims um and that they need to buy insurance as a result but what insurers are saying is okay well we kind of get that these things are going to happen but how can we minimize the loss uh, and I'd say that's these these automatic shutoff valves and and the fact that you can isolate uh, the bit that's that's leaking very quickly with a, almost a flick of a switch and it stops the loss at exactly that point once it's been discovered and it's uh, it's a, I mean in fact it can do it almost as it's been discovered if there's a, a these things are flow monitored uh, and if the flow of the water is such that it's it's happening at five times the amount it should do. Uh, when you're running a bath, for example, and then it runs on for longer than a running a bath would do, this automatic stop valve will recognise that and just turn off the, 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 the water flow into that area of the building. And therefore, all you've got out there is five minutes worth of, of pouring water rather than five hours worth. And you can imagine the obvious impact and reduction of impact that that would have. So again, this is this is many brilliant ideas that they've come up with within this this CIRA guidance note about sort of having people responsible for it, uh, putting that risk management in place, making sure it's happening, and then if if there's a failure in any way, what is the best way to reduce the impact of that failure? So it comes at it from those sort of many directions, uh, and as such, it's a, it's a very good and I have to say now free document for people to use. Um, that uh, that is available to be read by anyone that's involved in a project. Uh, there, I think there was a time when people were being charged for it, which which kind of counterintuitively meant that, well, why do I have to pay to learn about risk management? Well, I've been doing this for years, <laughs> um, and and yeah, it, it's it's now free to, and it's a it's a it's a good and sensible document. And my only gripe with it at the moment is that I think insurers are trying to make it. Uh, a condition precedent to liability that that it's followed and I'm I'm, a, I'm not a fan of that I wasn't a fan when insurers tried to do that a little bit with the joint code of practice for the prevention of fire on construction sites and, and as brokers I think we fought that one off and we sort of swapped it for an ability for insurers to visit the site and check that the code was being followed um, and offer risk improvements uh, recommendations if the, the code wasn't being followed. And ultimately, yes, they could say, right, well, okay, we've, we've come, we've visited, we've offered you advice. You either, ha if you haven't taken it, then we may well be able to, under the terms of the policy, we could limit the benefits that you might be able to get from this policy. Ultimately, I think if it was being flagrantly abused, they, they possibly did have the right to say, look, 
no more. This is ridiculous. Mm. You're not acting like a prudent, uninsured person. Um, so, the are you happy no. that I put the link to the CIREG document in the show notes? So, anybody listening, please do go and oh, have a absolutely. look. Absolutely. I mean, I was going to go, and here's the CIREG document for you. <laughs> Can you read it from there? <laughs> now you've got to sit, you've got to flip through every page really slowly. <laughs> oh, that page. I've always got my notes on it. <laughs> oh, fabulous. I, I've learned a lot uh, myself from you guys uh, just in this 30 minute conversation. And even more over the you know the last couple of conversations we've had, I think what would be a really good um, note to end on, apart from uh, the CIREG document, can you give me some ideas on how construction insurance insurers are helping the industry? What other things are they doing that if you don't know about, you do now once you've listened to this? Uh Construction insurers are actively working with their clients um, to help them improve their their risks. Um, if if a if a project is built without having an insurance claim, it's it's good for everyone. It's good for the client. It's good for the contractor. It's good for insurers. And and insurers, I think, in the last certainly within my career, at various stages, they've they've absolutely got that. And, and many of them actually employ their own risk engineers now and ask them to go to sites and share their knowledge with, with the people on the sites, generally the, the site engineers and site management team. And, and they, they will share best practice. They will encourage people to go in certain directions if they feel that they're not uh, following the best and available current risk management approaches. So, I mean, I think insurers have gone a long way already in in towards making the risk better for everyone yes it helps themselves but it certainly helps uh the uh, project owner and the contractors and again i think as you touched on earlier on uh when the when someone suffers a loss not everything's insured there are many aspects of an insurance claim uh where they turn around and say well no that's not part of an insurance claim that's not your time your effort your heartache over this project and and all of these other things I and mean, that's just the the, the phys non-physical ones uh they're, they're they're not an insurance claim you can't be paid for the fact that your kitchen ceiling came crashing down and and you're in tears at all of the new work that's just been done that's now ruined because of uh a dodgy bit of plumbing. Were and... you in my house last week, Steve? <laughs> Did you see all of that happen? My actual kitchen roof is on the floor. <laughs> it wasn't, but I have sympathy with the uninsured elements of your loss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fabulous. Jason, is there anything else you'd like to add um, that you know construction insurers are doing? Collaborations, any uh, promos that they're you know actively putting out there? I, I think really it is just that collaborative piece. Every project in, in construction is different. And so where there are consistent uh, risks, then of course insurers will create as they are doing with fire, as they are doing with water, these uh, you know blanket umbrella documents that, that can be applied to all projects. But what we tend to see is the risks of each and every project are very unique. That's why it's a specialty and it requires that risk expertise. Our role uh, working with the employers, the contractors, and of course the insurers as well, is to create a collaborative exercise where everybody's engaged, everybody's considering the unique risks of that particular project, and then looking at how that project can be de-risked, which is of course to the benefit of everybody because nobody wants to see a loss. So. Ultimately, uh, the great thing about our world is no two days are ever the same, but no two projects are ever the same. And so we try to just, you know, tackle each and every project based on the merits uh, of, of each. And, and of course, the nature of the risk profile of each project. Fabulous. I'm really grateful to both of you. Uh, I'm sure that those listening will have learned as much as I have. Are you happy that I put your details in the show notes? If anyone's got any questions, thoughts, wants to reach out to you for advice or, or potential, uh, you know, business. Yeah, that's absolutely great. Please Super. Do, Sarah. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm very grateful for your time. Have a wonderful rest of week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you have enjoyed what you have heard, have any questions or feedback, please leave us a review and we will be sure to get back to you. If you would like further information on how Boston Tullis Group can support your business, 
or if you would like to join us on an episode, please do not hesitate to contact us.